Alright guys, listen, um, we're going to kick off track one. Super excited. Uh, I, I wound up flying in from RSA, Joe flew in from RSA as well. Coming in hot to another con right after uh, the exhausting, painful experience of an RSA for real security practitioners um, is a thing. So I appreciate Joe doing this. Um, if you guys don't know, um, Joe was a winner of the CTF in 2017 at, at DerbyCon for social engineering. Um, incident response and blue team, super fabulous talent. And I think one of the things that um, you guys can take away from today are things that you can put in practice for you right away. So um, without further ado, Joe, I'll let you take the mic. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? I apologize, my voice is a little bit um, <clears throat> out of whack. Uh, in conjunction with speaking two days in a row uh, in California and seasonal allergies here and being back on my way to Tennessee for more seasonal allergies, it's the water. Um, so thanks for coming out. Um, this is Dear Blue Team. It's basically advice from the forensics team for non-forensic people to implement to make forensics easier. So basically, that's the, that's the gist behind this. Uh, before I get started, the thoughts and opinions expressed are not those of IBM. So why I say this, I'm a senior security architect at IBM, uh, 2017 DerbyCon Social Engineering Capture the Flag winner. Uh, I write a lot of blogs. Uh, I have my podcast, Advanced Persistent Security. I tap out a lot in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and supposedly you either win or you learn, so I learn a lot. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's what I've heard. Um, <clears throat> Uh, aside from that, I used to uh, navigate submarines in the Navy and done a little bit of everything in my time. So, trying to build the clicker button. There it is. Um, so, why this topic and this talk? So, I took SANS uh, Forensics 508, which is basically advanced uh, <clears throat> advanced forensics incident response and threat hunting. Uh, I'm sitting there. I'm reflecting on the stuff I've learned. I'm being a little bit too academic for my own taste, but that's okay. And I'm like, you know, some of the things in this course, why, why are we not doing them early on in the process? Why are we waiting until things have hit the fan, management's hair is on fire, they're breathing down our throats? Why are we not doing this? So this basically is a result of those thoughts. So, I mean, why aren't we? So start with a little baseline knowledge just to uh, level the playing field a little bit. So basically, we want to talk about what is DFIR. So it's digital forensics and incident response. Digital forensics being the science of figuring out what happened. Incident response being the holistic approach of the business in terms of how we get back to normal. And what is normal. So then we have to think about the difference between incident response and incident handling. Incident handling being a subset of incident response. Again, the response is the macro opinion where handling is a micro uh, segment of the response. So basically, um, the handling deals with things like chain of custody, and it's the logistics, the coordination, the planning, the response. There's your technical piece, right? Um, and here I've got the um, I've got the SANS incident response process. It's commonly referred to as PICRL. Preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, lessons learned. This talk focuses on taking things from other phases, such as eradication and recovery, and shifting them to the left, to the preparation phase. So that whenever you do end up in an incident response scenario, and you are in identification or another phase, you're able to have something to work off of, and you have a better baseline in terms of what is normal, and that's important. Um, but again, you know, this, this process is very linear, but this, at the same time, uh, in an incident response process, you may come across something, um, you'll identify something, you'll classify it, you'll move to contain it. You'll start to move into the eradication phase, and then something else is gonna pop up, and you're gonna find out you didn't properly contain it. So then you have to roll back. So understand that this process, while it is linear, it is also acceptable to roll back. And too often, we're too focused on just keeping the, the process progressing forward, and that typically makes things worse for everyone. Slows down the process, muddies it, angers management, 
probably cuts down on IT's budget, unfortunately. Um, so to bring in threat intelligence into the equation, you know, if we want to hit some buzzwords today, um, sometimes it's cyber threat intelligence, I'll just call it CTI. Um, but basically, where does it, you know, where does this fit in? How do we use it, right? It, is it a consumable of forensics and incident response? Or is it a deliverable of forensics and incident response? Anyone? Is correct. So basically, with that, they're not one and the same. CTI basically enables you to have some concepts to use and some context to look for within your forensic endeavors. And they're even more important when you're, when you're talking about things like threat hunting. Because oftentimes when we think threat intelligence, we think IDS signatures, maybe URLs, maybe sticks, taxi, whatever. But it goes so much further than that. So let's talk about the types of forensics very briefly. Um, we've got the file system or disk forensics. And I've listed some tools that go alongside this, um, such as uh, Sleuth Kit, Autopsy, which is the GUI for Sleuth Kit, uh, Scalpel and Foremost, um, and then of course to some degree uh, Volatility, even though it's more focused in memory. FTK, of course, in case there, there's all the vendor stuff. I tried to stick with things that were free. Because um, free is my favorite price. Uh, on the network side, you've got like Network Miner, Wireshark, uh, there's a few other tools I've not really played too much with, but I researched to find out that they existed, uh, like Moloch and then uh, TCP Dump, of course. And then uh, last night I was having a conversation about uh, trying to predict uh, another company's uh, outage windows because it was affecting an adjacent company that was a customer, and basically they're like, hey, why didn't you tell us? And they're like, well, the terms of, terms of service. And he was like, well, to what level can we monitor this organization to determine when they're about to do this? I was like, well, in a non-intrusive way, you could use NetFlow, right? Because it's all metadata, and the court's already ruled that, I mean, for NSA, looking at people's phone data, as long as it's metadata, you don't know what they were talking about. You just know who was talking to who for how long and when. I mean, it's, it's the same, right? Um, but then when we talk about memory forensics, and that's really what this presentation is focused on, uh, we have volatility, which is probably um, the first and foremost whenever you're talking memory forensics. Uh, recall, which originally was a fork of volatility. It's now maintained by Google and integrated into Google Rapid Response, which is their agent-based uh, response system. Um, and then you have uh, Redline, which is a GUI, which we'll, we'll look at a little bit later. Uh, FTK Imager doesn't really do the forensics, um, in, the, in the imager light at least, um, but it helps you acquire the memory image. Without an image, you can't really do the memory forensics, right? Uh, if we want to talk about operating systems, I'm a big fan of SIFT, uh, SANS Investigative Forensic Toolkit. Uh, you can download it from SANS website for the, for the steep price of free 99. Um, for free 50, you can also download Remnix from SANS. Uh, coincidentally, you can actually install them on top of each other. So you can download SAN, uh, SIFT and install Remnix on top of it so that you have the ability to reverse engineer any malware that you come across in your incident response efforts. You can also install SIFT on top of Remnix if you'd like. If you're really lazy you don't change the default passwords, um, I find that the word malware is a lot easier to type than forensics. So I would install SIFT on top of Remnix because there's your default password. Um, if you don't want to go with the SANS ecosystem, which some people don't, that's okay. Uh, there's another one called Kang, that's a computer-aided investigative uh, network environment. To some degree, Kali has the capability, it has the whole forensics thing. I've not tried it out, it may work amazingly, but I, I like to kind of keep those things separated. You don't, you don't want to get into attack mode whenever you're trying to figure out the problem. Um, there used to be an operating system called Mercenary Linux. I'm not sure if it truly exists anymore or not. I've reached out to the author, I've not heard back, so um, if I don't hear back in a couple of weeks, I'm just going to cut that bullet. But anyway, so to continue down our um, rabbit hole of buzzwords, we hear about threat hunting. And when you heard proactive digital forensics efforts, that may have been what came to mind. And you're not wrong, but that's not where I'm going with this. Um, so basically, the tools and techniques, it's almost identical to forensics. The only difference is, in forensics, you have some context as in terms of what has happened, what am I looking for that would trigger such an event, 
In threat hunting, it's like nothing has happened. I'm looking for things that could potentially happen later. So you're relying more heavily on specific indicators of compromise coming from the CTI that you may consume. So that's the important piece with that. In terms of benefits, it's going to absolutely supercharge your incident response efforts because you're in a proactive state vice a reactive state. It might hurt your budget a little bit, but that's okay. Um, and in terms of maturity, it's not for everybody. If you, if you have not met at least the first five uh, Center for Internet Security Critical Security Controls, formerly known as the SANS Top 20, I mean, realistically, you shouldn't be doing much of anything but meeting those first. But if you don't have an incident response plan and a, and a mature incident response program, you have no reason to be threat hunting. Because you're going to go hunting, you're going to find all this stuff, but you have no documented plan. What are you going to do with the stuff you find? So the maturity there is definitely very important. And there are automated solutions. To some degree, a lot of the EDR stuff like uh, Carbon Black and Silence, they have that capability to some degree. Uh, Endgame has a product that does that as well. Um, I've not really played with them, so I can't speak to the uh, efficiency of it. So that basically, this is a side-by-side -side comparison of what I was talking about. So basically, you have very few prerequisites for DFIR. Basically, your requisite for true digital forensics in a reactive sense is an incident. That's your prerequisite. You have, you have an information system. You have an incident. Something happened. Somebody did something stupid. All right, let's find out. It's reactive. Um, you may find out via monitoring. The feds might come beating down your door and say, oh, and uh, by the way, um, I want to take a look at this. Um, do you mind if we take over the investigation? Which, that's a completely different talk for a completely different day. But basically, from the business sense, you're trying to get things up and running quickly. Right? Because downtime means money. Businesses don't like to lose money. So again, with threat hunting, you have the prerequisites dealing with the maturity, the size, and the capabilities. It is proactive. And again, it does focus on consuming the threat intelligence that you've received. But the thing is, and this is why I have a few objections to consulting firms offering threat hunting as a service. It's based around what is normal. When I was a consultant and I did incident response, I walked in and I had no clue what was normal because I hadn't been in their system before. So in terms of threat hunting, it's one of those things that you probably need an internal team to do it. So if you need to justify this, basically my thought would be you have an incident response team. While they're not actively responding, they're hunting. If they don't want to hunt and they're not responding, they can research, but hunting is going to protect the organization a little bit better and honestly it'll keep their reactions to a minimum. But nevertheless, at the same time, there's you, you, you don't want the time objective, but you don't want to spend four years threat hunting for a single uh, piece of threat intelligence. I mean, in theory, I would say we shouldn't be hunting for things like uh, MS-17010 or MS-08067, but I mean, time and time again, it's proven that those things are still around. So, and before we go into the actual fun part of the Deer Blue team, let's go ahead and get the standard talk out of the way. So, you need to log. Do it for most, do it within reason. Storage is your main limiting factor. When you're talking about log storage, you want to do it somewhere else. You put logs on the same host and you don't ship it somewhere else, whether it be to another host within your organization or into the cloud. What's going to happen when the attacker just goes in and hits it with, um, I mean, let's talk anti forensics for a second, with a tool called SRM, which before it deletes it, it's going to overwrite it several times. If you're shipping it somewhere else, I don't care if you overwrite it. Overwrite it all day. I'll see those events too. Great. Thanks. Um, but at the same time, logging will make you or break you. The number of times I walked onto a client site for incident response, I said, hey, let me see your logs. Oh, what logs? That kind. Gotcha. Thanks. And it wouldn't have been so bad if this specific client that I have in mind had not just paid $32,000 in Bitcoin because they had uh, an RDP server hanging out on the public internet with a four character administrator password. Someone logged in, hit them with Samson, and they called it fileless ransomware. Hmm. Yep. Darwin exists in IT too. <laughs> but you need to inventory everything, right? If you look at the SANS critical security controls, number one and number two, 
Identify authorized and unauthorized hardware, that's number one. Software, that's number two. Okay, how do we inventory this? What do we do? Okay, we have all these tools that do all this cool stuff. Vulnerability scanning will pick up on a lot of that. Um, I mean, you can, if you're in a Windows environment, there's a PowerShell script called Kansa, K-A-N-S-A, that will actually go and interrogate all your Windows hosts and extract this information for you. It's beautiful. But you have to update this frequently because you don't do an annual inventory and say, yep, we got an inventory. What happens when um, Steve, the executive, uh, who, who's a, an early adopter, I mean, he had Google Glasses, come on now, let's go with this, um, brings his new IoT doohickey into work, and because he's an executive, IT won't tell him no, and he puts it on the network. Next thing you know, somebody's driving by in a car, they find it, they exploit the Zigbee piece, now all your base are theirs. Active. Gotta have some sort of network time. If you're in a single office, you can probably get away without having NTP or something like that. But you need something. You need a uniform time to make sure that when you're looking at log data, you're looking at timelines, you're looking at artifacts, you're not having to do the math in your head and say, okay, well, this is the Kansas City office, um, this happened in the New York City office, and then something else happened in the Brisbane, Australia office. What's the time zone difference? No, set it to one time, whether it be uh, GMT, uh, whether it be one time or another, headquarters time, it doesn't matter. You can pick whatever time you want. No one's going to punish you if you pick the less than one time. Um, but set something. So, you know, it's just something to look at. Baselines. I'm going to get into that in exhaustive detail very shortly. But it's just something that we always hear. Have a baseline. Have a baseline. Okay, well, what, what does a baseline consist of? Have a baseline. It's like, so uh, are you for the Cardinals or the Royals? That's the equivalent of someone answering with, yes. Um, purple polka dots. Totally. So here's some softish skills you need to think of when dealing with incident response. And this should definitely go into your incident response plan. And with this, I'm going to get on a very small high horse for your I'll call, I'll call it a high pony because it's, it's not a true high horse, it's very small um, for a very short period of time. But basically, when you're defining incident response type stuff, you need to let people know who to notify. Don't just say, notify IT. Okay, because they're going to call the help desk and they're going to be like, have you tried turning it off and back on again? <laughs> it's ransom. Okay, again, have you tried turning it off and back on again? You're like, no, Roy, it's ransomware. How do you notify them? I'll give you a hint. If someone clicks a fish, you probably don't want to report via email. In fact, email is probably the least preferred method, period. I like the idea of text, in person, via phone, carrier pigeon, smoke signals, Morse code, um, Campbell soup cans on a rope, whatever you want. I would say stay out of email. So look for the fact of you run the risk of an attacker having access to the email, seeing what your next moves are, and then bypassing everything every time. And it's basically going to be a game of cat and mouse. And we've all seen Tom and Jerry. Tom never wins. So what actions do we want someone to take when something fishy is happening on, happening on the computer? Do we want them to turn it off, reboot it, unplug it from the wall, unplug it from the network, log off, restart, do nothing? What? I can't tell you the right answer because I don't know your forensic posture. There, there are forensic implications that deal with each of those actions. And in that sense, that's something that you and your organization have to define so that you can tell people what to properly do. Because the vast majority of our organizations, they're not security people unless you work for a security company. And even then, you're dealing with non-security people. As an industry, this is the high pony. And especially on Twitter, we get on this whole uh, rampage of blaming the users. The users are stupid, and, and like in social engineering, I hear that all the time, and it just absolutely burns me up because it's like, okay, as a social engineer, you're saying that your client's employees are stupid. The same employees that signed the contract for you to come in and fish them. So does that mean they're stupid for hiring you? And let, let's face it, there are stupid people in the world. I, I don't disagree with that. But the thing is, as an industry, we need to take the burden off the user. We need to enable the user to do what they need to do in a secure manner. And we need to have that relationship with them so they can report things to us because that's what we need. 
if somebody reports that they clicked on a fish and they get beat over the head with a bug, uh, suspended or fired, what's going to happen to the next person that clicks the fish? They're not going to report it. You're going to find out when you're having to buy Bitcoin. It's just the reality of things. Um, so we just need to enable them to do their job, and we need to have a clear understanding of how to report things. Something I really like, so when I was in the military, we had these papers beside every single phone that I ever talked on in the military, except for the sound powered ones. Um, and those are a real thing. And basically it was a bomb threat worksheet. Someone calls in a bomb threat, here are the questions you ask, here are the things you try to find out. Why do we not do that for incident response? Why do we not have a worksheet next to every single computer saying, you think you have an incident, what time was it, what's your host name, what's this, what's so forth and so on. So when they call to report something, or they, they shake the Campbell soup can to get your attention, you put it up to your ear, they tell you everything that you want to know within reason. Another thing, I love all the colors of Cat5 or Cat6 cable. I love them all. Here's the thing, you need to use one single color in your organization, and I don't recommend black. Because you, you could very easily say, if you want people to disconnect from the network when something happens, say, unplug the yellow cable in the back of your computer. My mom is tech illiterate. If I told her to unplug a yellow cable, she can unplug a yellow cable. If you say unplug the network cable, there's a good chance that power cable is going because it's going to be the easiest to unplug. You don't want them to take certain actions. Just like that client that had the uh, Sam Sam with the, uh, the four character admin password, they deleted the VM. So when I came in to do IR, I'm like, let me see the, uh, let me see the host. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> Which, I mean, in hindsight, we could have went through and actually done uh, file system forensics and recovered it via data carving, but they didn't have that many billable hours. So that's just the reality of it. Um, you've got to look at your policies and procedures. It all depends on what you want to do. Like, an action not to take, maybe don't inform law enforcement. Because there are pros and cons to informing law enforcement. You might get a lot of high-end help, you might get a lot of insight you wouldn't otherwise have, but they may also take over your investigation and draw the process out uh, as opposed to getting it back up and running like you want. So keep that in mind. Um, don't change the password of a compromised account. Because that right there, if you, if you try to take that to court, it's going to have a hard time building up. Respect the chain of custody. It's going to be paramount because that's one of the main uh, overlapping things between security professionals and lawyers. We both understand the chain of custody, or in theory we do. So let's get into the cool stuff. Memory forensics, so we have several tools like FTK Imager, uh, Recall, GER, DD, so forth and so on. Again, we have Recall and uh, Volatility to do the assessment for the command line, and then you have, uh, it's a FireEye product called uh, Redline uh, that does it from the 3,000 foot view as a GUI. I will caution you, you do not want to use anything above version 1.20. They took away this really cool feature called the MRI, the Malware Risk Index. So I use version 1.14, it's the last one before. Uh, it's beautiful and you'll see why shortly. So basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to see what's running on the live system. This could be, this might not be in the logs yet. This may not be in the file system yet. They may do some process hollowing and do some side channel stuff to a DLL. You may not see any tracks of that, otherwise you can find it using memory forensics in some cases. So basically, you know, when, when you say, oh, I, I do forensics, oh yeah, um, how about memory? Oh no, I, I just deal with logs. Okay, cool, well, that's kind of forensics, I guess. Um, but you might not, you might see more context <coughs> outside of that. What if I told you volatility can replace the system terminal suite? Most everything that it does, volatility has a plugin for it. There are a few examples up there, like Procmon, Procdump. You can use those instead. If you have some network information, you could run something like NetScan and confirm the data uh, out of memory. You can confirm that with file system forensic. Cross correlate. You can even create a timeline uh, via a body file which a body file is basically uh, something that you're going, it's, it's the output of something like SleuthKit, the output of something like Volatility. Ultimately, you're going to use a tool like log to timelinepython to execute and create a timeline in a CSV format for you to go down the line. You can create in all of those, and what I like to do is I like to look at each of them individually, but then I like to append them all together 
on a host base and on the massive scale and just go down the line and you can see where somebody pivots, how, how it happened. <coughs> Excuse me. So basically, you can assess the processes. So we, we, we hear all this talk of nation states and how, it, how invasive they can be and how, how stealthy they are. What I'm about to say might not be applicable to them, but for most other persistent adversaries, <clears throat> you can actually find when a registry key was installed. And that is truth. You can modify what the registry key says. You might be able to tamper with logs. You can do time stomping. But within volatility, you can go and find the registry key creation date. And that is truth. You can also, there are several plugins that actually deal with malware analysis. Malsys proc, malfind, that's a couple right off the bat. And it's going to look at things like file headers and then the consistency of how the processes, uh, drivers, handles, and strings are uh, associated. So when we look at this, here are a few capabilities of volatility modules. And I've got the modules in parentheses. So for example, you can use Mimikatz in volatility to dump every password. If you want the hashes, you can do that too. You want to find rogue, rogue processes? There's the process stuff. PS Total is amazing. It actually creates a dot file that you can convert to an image, and it'll actually color code things that you should probably look at because they don't add up. It's beautiful. Look at the networking. So NetScan, if you're dealing with anything after XP, it's NetScan. Before that, you had like ConScan, connections, sockets, all that fun stuff. You can get DLLs. You can even carve processes. Carve the process, go to virus total. Carve the process, get the hash, drop it in threat miner, threat crowd, OTX, IBM uh, X-Force Threat Exchange, whatever. You find out when things really happen. That's that registry key creation date that I was talking about. Um, the timeline, you know, malware, there's those processes as well. So basically, this right here, if there's nothing else you want to take from this, this is what you want to do. So you need a golden image. You need a golden image for your organization, and you need one for each role in your organization. Because HR needs different software than IT, than accounting, than help desk, than your normal, regular, non-administrative employees. I guess warehouse employees, I'll, I'll use that example. Um, so basically, we have that. We have the version. So when you create this standard image, you execute the image, and you capture the memory. Remember that baseline thing I mentioned? There it is. You have baseline memory, which is more important than file names, file versions, hashes. It's more important than any of that. Those things play a role, don't get me wrong, but they're more important. Another example, prefetch. Within this, you can use prefetch parser. Basically, uh, it came about in XP, and it looks for prefetch files. It tells you, hey, this file executed. You can also use that to determine when something was downloaded. It's beautiful. In the system and there's no prefetch, it means one of two things. It wasn't configured or it went bye-bye. If it went bye-bye, then you're going to want to go try to recover that using file system forensics. Something to look at. Um, the shim cache, also known as the application compatibility cache. Basically because systems don't like to play nice with each other, this checks for compatibility every time something executes. So you can find out subsequent executions of files. You can find things like standard information, which is beautiful, uh, full file path, the file size, any, any process execution flags, the last update time. It's always beautiful. So processes. OK, so I like, I like hashes. So there are some things that are Trojans quite frequently or, or common file names, like SVC host. That's, that's a good one. So if you see SVC host, and it's executing somewhere besides Windows System 32, and it does not have the minus K switch, you probably want to take a closer look. So hashing in this equation, I recommend that you script with, say, a for statement um, to go and get an MD5 of every file that you consider viable. Maybe your C Windows or C Windows System 32. Basically, all the fun stuff. So get an MD5 of it, record it in a file, store that file for that system somewhere. I mean, you can zip it up and put it with the memory image. Then take it a step further. There's a thing called fuzzy hashing, which is byte by byte hashing. You're going to use a tool called SSD. So when you see something, you check the MD5. The MD5 doesn't match. You can check the SSD and say, this is where it changed. 
what changed? Was this based on the Windows update, or did uh, somebody come in and alter something? With your registry keys, take a backup of that, hash that as well. If you're not updating software, for the most part, a few exceptions exist, the vast majority of the registry won't be changing too often. You can, you can even script these things with regular expressions, whether it be um, version numbers, registry keys, whatever. Take the time to do it because these are all things that's going to make your life easier when something hits the fan. And the thing is, you don't want to think of if it hits the fan, it's when it hits the fan because it happens. So with the baselines, we have that memory image. What do we do with the, with the current image? Well, Volatility has plugins that you can actually do process, driver, and service baselines. You can compare those two images and it will basically do the equivalent of a diff and tell you the difference. Okay, these are some things you want to look at. Okay, did they run a Windows update on this and we just didn't get an image on it? Okay, well, checked. Oh, well, here's SPC host again. Wait, what's PS exec doing here? That process isn't supposed to be there. So basically, you could do it of every single host, you could do it of every single image. For the sake of being realistic, I say every single master image. When you talk about every single host, you're talking some massive file sizes. Your system has 12 gigs of RAM, well, you take a memory image, that's a 12 gig file. Your VM has 12 gigs of RAM, if it's VMware, it's 12 gigs of RAM. If it's VirtualBox, that's ever how many, uh, whatever the size is, that's actually currently being used. So, something to keep in mind. But, you know, you, you can script it and pass it off to a cloud instance or an internal server, um, whatever you like there. You could, you could script it, you could, the storage is the problem, because storage, we're going to get back to that. We've got to pay to store everything. Whether you're paying it for the cloud through S3, um, hoping your bucket's not leaking, but you know, you're paying for that. You're paying for the hardware within your organization to store something. At the end of the day, storage is money. So let's uh, take a quick look. But before, I'm going to skip the demo for a moment, and I'm just going to hit one more slide, and then we'll get to the demo piece. <coughs> I'm not going to get deep into memory forensics, but this is a single slide that could probably help you out here too. So take PCAPs as often as possible. Most sims will allow you to script this. So if something suspicious happens, you're going to get a PCAP. I like that idea, but I don't like that idea. I don't like that idea because the sim has to know something's going wrong, and that means you're probably going to miss the, the header of the file. That's the unfortunate thing. It's also a storage nightmare. Uh, integrate with your sim. Look at things like NetFlow. Have your logs. Do your PCAPs, have your vulnerability data, because for the most part, vulnerability data is indicative of something that happened. I'm not going to say that a vulnerability caused everything, but oftentimes it does. With your PCAPs, you can use like Network Miner or Wireshark to carve them. You can carve files out and say, hey, this is what's going on here. Cool. So, with that being said, I'm going to shift the screen uh, and do a little bit of a demo. So, just shifting to Duplicate. I forgot to open FTK <laughs> Imager. So I think it's in this directory. No, it's not. So I'll execute that, and while it's doing its thing. I'm going to go ahead and open a previous analysis um, from, uh, let's just do this. So I'm just opening this analysis. This is a stored man's file, which is what uh, Redline saves the files as. Um, and it's basically had a memory image that's been imported into it. So right here we're seeing the processes. Right here's the MRI. So that whole red dot, that goes away after version 1.2, or after, uh, with 1.20 and later. But we can do all sorts of things. So we can even look at the hierarchical processes. So we can see what triggered what. So, we'll, uh, let's do this. Let's go back here momentarily. We're looking for PID 6404. This should show up. Oh, right here it is. Oh, there's PS Exec. What's going on here? 
Here's spinlock.exe as well. Something else to look at. So we can go a little bit further and under the processes, we can even look at what ports are being used. And again, this is at the 30,000 foot view. When I have a memory image, I like to start here and then work my way into volatility and get deep in the weeds. So here we see what's running and where. Um, we don't have the MRI on this one, but basically we can see the remote addresses and what port, and the status and everything else. That is something important because if you have a host that's beaconing out to something, you're going to get a little context around it, which is definitely important as well. So you can go a little bit further. You can look at a timeline. You can look at the acquisition history. Um, you can look at strings, even memory sections if you'd like. Let this load and then we'll uh, take a look. I believe that would be the, I'll go ahead and kill this. It's a resource hog I don't know. I think, um, so I tried to get this talk at B-Sides Orlando uh, earlier this month, and three slides had a blue screen of death on me. Uh, so I improv the whole talk. Um, but uh, I think it's because I had too many processes running. Um, so I uh, cut my VM size down from four gigs to two gigs, and then do it that way. So if you want to take a memory image with FTK Imager Lite, this is free, the Lite version. So you just go here and you say, capture memory. The thing is you don't have to install this on the system either. So you can have it on a thumb drive. I would use two thumb drives. Have it on one thumb drive, get the memory image on the other. If it's a server, you might need a, a, an external hard drive instead of a thumb drive. Because when you're, anytime you're dealing with memory for forensics, you want to have 110% or more of the capacity. So you have a 10 gig hard drive, you need at least 11 gigs. So, but anyway, you give it a destination path, you give it a file name, you can collect the page file and so on, and then you just say capture. And it's off to the races. Once it's done, you have it, you can go off, you can do your analysis. Import it into uh, Redline, import it into Volatility, uh, whatever. Catalog it because it's off your standard image. It's definitely an option as well. So that's that. Um, so then within, this is SIFT. So right here, um, I, have def I have ran image info on the system. So I now know what it is. We have the KDGB number here. We know how many processors, all of that stuff. Uh, we know it's a service pack one. So right here, the suggested profiles, Windows 7, service pack zero, or service pack one. Here you'll see I've exported the profile into service pack one. So that's just gonna make my command line a little bit easier. So. Um, we will give it the file hyphen f in the file. You can you can set this up uh, as an export as well. And let's just do Netscan. So we'll see the network connections. That's a good place to start. And it, it takes a minute to do it. And while it's doing that um, over here in Network Miner, I'm going to import a pcap. These pcaps are fun. We'll go to that one in a minute. Got a lot of PCAPs here, you see. So we'll just look at something uh, over SMB. So while that's important, we're seeing some data here. Notice at the bottom, I do not have PuTTY running. That's going to be important in a moment. PuTTY is, PuTTY is there, but it is not running. <coughs> Okay, while that's still doing its thing, I'll do the network side. So basically we see that we, within this capture we have two hosts. We have one session, some parameters here, nothing too big. Within these hosts, we can expand it, and I apologize, I can't blow this up anymore. Um, it doesn't zoom in or out. And again, this is a free tool. If you want a paid version, it's like 1300 bucks, you get a little bit more capability. And I mean, I, I like things that are free, whether it be for the attack side, the forensic side, my social engineering or my OSINT stuff, I don't like to pay for things. If there, there are too many free tools out there to be paid for something. Um, but anyway, we have some data here, like how many packets were sent, the file size, the received, the sessions, all that fun stuff. So let's look at this. Oh, there's a file. Look what it is. It's putty.exe. So with this, we can calculate the hashes. So like with malware, we can take these hashes, put it in our, our indicators of compromise, we can put it in virus total, uh, threat crowd, threat minor, whatever we want. 
Um, so we have that. We can also open the folder, which is basically going to show us the file right here. You can upload that straight to VirusTotal as well. If you double click it though, if it's malware and you double click it, you're gonna get malware too though. But anyway, you have that side. But, remember, Putty's not running. It is now. So, just pull the executable straight out of it. So, we'll take a look at another one really quick. I would say we can look at WannaCry, but I'll be honest, it's incredibly boring. With that one, there's just not a whole lot of interesting stuff. So we'll look at Neutrino. We see there's a lot more files here, but let's look at the hosts. So here we see all these domains. Hmm, okay. My first reaction is I'm going to go and see if these are in any threat intelligence feeds. Okay. Then I'm going to write some sort of regular expression or a ER yar rule to go see where else other systems on my in my environment connected with these hosts, both on the host and the IP level. So um, other things that we can find out here, again, there's the IP, there's the Mac, the vendor, host name, we can go a little bit further. Um, host details right here. So we see it's a web, web server with engine X. So there's some information for you as well. So definitely important. We have a lot of parameters here that we can look at all kinds of stuff. So user agent, path, if you have the time to sift through this, you can get a lot of stuff out of it. Again though, it takes time. Um, here's the sessions. There's a credential that's passed. So then we can even copy that username and password if we want. So anyone here that's on the attack side, you can probably use this for malice too if you'd like. Um, but here we have five files. I always like to look by file size. Oh, there's a shockwave file. Hmm. So you can look at the hash, you can compare it. I'll give you a hint. I looked at it on all the stuff. Yep, yeah, it's there. Um, I uploaded the file, it's there. Um, I didn't execute the file though. But uh, you can use this for an example to see like, when you see like a two gig HTML file, it's probably indicative of there's a little bit more that meets the eye there. But look at things like file size, file consistencies. Where it was going, where it came from. These are all things that are important. So that's pretty much the end on network minor. Now let's go back to volatility. Here are all the network connections of that host. So we can even go further, and it's going to take longer, but we can even, we can pipe this to grep commands. So we can say, egrep minus v and exclude things, or we can grep for only established connections, or only closed connections, or only connections on port 80. So you can go so far with it. Um, I saw on Twitter today that um, there was a statement that things would get hacked today. So I'm contributing to my red team effort right here by running Mimi Kevins. So just gotta contribute to the cause. Oh, there's the passwords. Black Widow, um, Bang Dumb Bang, Hail Hydra. This is an actual passphrase, and then there's a lot there on that w, uh, WKS user account. So, you know, you can you can see patterns here. You can be like, wait a minute, we don't have a user in Active Directory named Vibranium. What's going on here? Let's take a closer look. Um, and there's a lot of other things you can do with it. Uh, unfortunately, with volatility, a lot of your time is spent waiting. So I'm just going to run these two uh, for the time being. And I'm going to pause that. And let me shift back over to the rest of the presentation. Unfortunately, I've got to close my presenter mode first. That's okay. Okay, so we finished up the demo piece. So uh, paying homage to uh, the original founder, or one of the founders of uh, my local uh, DEF CON chapter, DC865, Adrian Sinabria, some of you may know him. Um, he can now clearly see the rain is gone because of this information. 
Um, the context behind this is he was at InfoSec World and some vendor had an owl and he had his picture made with the owl on his hand and he was doing this impression of the owl. But understanding that InfoSec people, we like to mock each other, we like to rib each other. So this is the official, not the meme is not, but that picture is the official logo of uh, DC 865 now. So if you want to contact me, there's my contact information. I'll have it on a later slide as well. Um, but in the last few minutes of the presentation, I want to talk about a mentorship program that I've put together in coordination with Peerlist. It's called Through the Hacking Glass. Mm -hmm. Basically, we know we have academia, we know we have certifications, and we know that neither of them fills up everything. Basically, what I'm trying to do is get qualified mentors and ambitious mentees together to learn and do things in between those two things, academia and certification. So basically, it's a five by five model, five rules, five levels of difficulty. It's more than a CTF because the mentor will do things like assign you reading and writing assignments because let's face it, writing is an important part of what we do. Whether you like it or not, I don't care if you're a pen tester, if you're a researcher, IR, help desk, you write reports, even if you're in the SOC. But then you do labs and then you get put into the range. The range is a linear process that starts out We'll have someone come in and harden the system and then pass it off. After that phase is over, someone's going to be monitoring as someone is attacking. After that phase is complete, someone will come in and do incident response on it, and then all that stuff will be passed to someone else to create threat intelligence. It's not going to get published to the public because we don't want people's, like, people who are not doing malicious things, we don't want their public IP being included in threat intel feeds, but something to that effect. You get a report card as a mentee. You get a report card to show a potential employer well, it will have feedback from your mentor and from the team from the range. The levels of difficulty, single system, two to five systems, small office, home office, homogenous enterprise, heterogeneous enterprise. We're working with vendors to get NFR licenses, not for resale licenses, so you can actually use enterprise stuff. And then the other side of the coin, because I have a certain um, love-hate relationship with salespeople, we're not allowing salespeople to solicit mentors or mentees. If a mentor or mentee gives them their information, that's on them. And you're told that you can do so if you want to learn more about the product. Anything a vendor's allowed to, the, well the only thing that vendors are allowed to give you would be technical documentation and technical training. No sales documentation, no sales pitches, no pre-sales training. Only technical stuff, period. And we'll probably miss out on a few vendors for that, but I think that is more important than getting people harassed. I mean, it's just the way it is. There's the contact information for Ed. Here's my upcoming speaking engagements. I am a uh, glutton for punishment, if you haven't noticed already. Uh, the one in bold uh, at Social Engineer Rhode Island, I've got an eight hour social engineering workshop. That's what this shirt is actually for. So if you want the shirt, the link's there. I don't get any money off the shirt, but it's 25 bucks. Um, and with SERI, the course is through AC Council. You'll get the shirt, you'll get the class, it's pretty fun. I just finished writing it, but uh, that's everything coming up. And with that being said, before we go with questions. If anyone wants a free ticket to Hacker Halted, there's some coupon codes. Uh, if you want 25% off training, there's a coupon code for that. And any questions? <coughs> All right. I, will oh, I have a question. The, I'm sorry. When doing uh, memory capture, um, I'm, I'm concerned about things like latency because it's an active system. Things are going on. The memory is changing uh, while you're doing the capture. Is it possible to get into a mode where the, the capture is not the value to because of the changes that happen between the time you start and the time you end? Not really. Uh, so it's just going to be a point in time, just like anything else. It's a point in time. Uh, but the nature of the beast that comes with that. With the, with, in terms of latency, that's why I advocate using thumb drives or something via really USB and not doing it over the network. Yes? <clears throat> it's, it's just a matter of preference. It, it's like saying I want to use Cali instead of Parrot. So, any other questions? So, I've been uh, reading a lot lately about the uh, case, 
experience with it, okay. uh, personally. But, I mean, one image, I don't want to say that one's much greater than the other. And the thing is, with volatility, you can actually do image copy and change the format as well. You can do the same thing with the hibernation file and volatility file as well. Okay, if there are no other questions, thank you for your time. And here's the information if you want to rate the conference, rate my talk, or anything else. Thanks for having me.